Can I do this? Can I do this? Yeah? Okay. <coughs> I just want to annoy the cameraman a little bit. Uh, <coughs> so, thank you uh, all for coming. Thank you for your interest uh, in this subject. Um, I may not look Korean, but I've, uh, I've lived... Oh. Let me take a handheld. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me at the back, all right? Yep. Okay, good. Um, I was saying I may not look Korean, uh, but I've lived in South Korea for 35 years. And uh, in the old days, Korea was, uh, it was a very exciting country. Um, and you felt like you were at the center of the world until you left and went somewhere else and you found nobody really knew anything about it, nobody cared. Uh, now that's changed and I think probably the reason is um, a few years ago the issue of North Korea nuclear weapons got onto the desk of the American president. And since then I think we've all become far more familiar with North Korea and South Korea to some extent. So, seeing there's so many people here, I'd like to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank, uh, you know, for their contribution to book sales on behalf of Suki and myself and, and all writers on Korean themes. I'd like to thank Donald Trump and uh, this, uh, this young man, this young man, uh, is that Kim Jong-il? It's yeah, Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-il. Uh, and his son, Kim Jong-un, who's carrying, <coughs> carrying on the good work. Uh, and I tell you, book sales have never been better. So, uh, <laughs> nuclear weapons. All right, so, uh, what we're going to do, Suki is going to run through some slides. Um, uh, are you going to talk through them, or just? I'm just going to talk through them very yeah. quickly. And then we'll talk a little bit, then we'll invite you to uh, ask questions, okay? Could I have that song? I thought we'll start with a song.
Hi. So um, that song, uh, Without You There Is No Us, uh, is a song that is uh, played so often in North Korea. So when I was embedded there uh, as a, an evangelical and a school teacher in 2011, I heard it so often that uh, I started humming back in New York where I live. Um, and this song, as you can see from what we just saw, are about two things that makes up that world, which is the great leader and also the hatred of the United States. Um, so I'm gonna briefly just go through some images so we can get into uh, that world that we're talking about. Can I have the image on the screen? Um, so um, this is a NASA photo of what North Korea is. The dark spot is North Korea, there's no light. And South Korea, uh, where I was born and raised, is um, in Seoul, is, is, you know, and that's the 38th parallel div that, that divides that country. And you can see the absolute darkness and isolation. Uh, I was born and raised in South Korea. I come from a family that's been separated by the Korean War. It's not that unusual for Koreans to have suffered loss of their family members during the war back in 1950 that lasted until 1953, which then Korea was divided in 1945. Um, about millions of people were separated. <laughs> Mine was one of them. Um, and I immigrated to America. I became a writer. I first went to North Korea in 2002. I did a, a, a feature for New York Review of Books. I couldn't believe uh, in 2002 what I was seeing. As a Korean, it broke my heart. As a writer, I couldn't get over that this world was not being properly investigated. <laughs> From then on began my research that took a decade. I uh, went to North Korea five times, all through different um, reasons. I went and covered the New York Philharmonic in Pyongyang in 2011, so I saw it as a journalist. I saw it in a different eyes, and I knew what was very obvious each time I went in, it was impossible to write about this world, because you just get a sanctioned visit for a couple of days, and the government basically gives you a minder and then leads you on this sort of a tour of the country, and they handpick what you're supposed to do, see and who you're supposed to talk to. And if you deliver that information into whatever article you're writing, I just didn't see how that is journalism. That's actually a press release for the world's most brutal regime. So I needed to find a way in. <laughs> Meanwhile, I did travel to all the border regions and interviewed uh, hundreds, over 100 defectors uh, from where North Koreans flee from uh, you know, China to Mongolia to Laos to Thailand in South Korea. Um, also interview, were embedded with smugglers to see what the border activity was. And this was in order to understand North Korea from every angle because most defectors come from the bottom layer of North Korea. Uh, so then what is going on with the top class? In 2011, I found a way in by quoting an organization for a number of years who were evangelical Christians who were building a university in Pyongyang for the sons of elite. So that's when I went in in 2011 and lived with these young men, 270 of them, who were the future leadership of North Korea, who were then 20-year-olds. So this world that is completely dark, I just want you to want to give you a couple of, um, so this idea of the great leader, uh, we are now with a third one, Kim Jong-un, who is the youngest leader in the world. Um, there have been three guys, starting with Kim Il-sung to your left, and then Kim Jong-il, and then Kim Jong-un. So since Korea was uh, divided, uh, in 1945 by the Allies, uh, they have ruled that nation. And that whole world is so ruled by them that when you enter, you have to bow to their portraits. Um, all the books there are generally written about the great leader or written by the great leader. Uh, the television really only has one channel. There are three channels, but they don't really seem to work. Uh, so basically one channel, and that one channel plays great leader programs about the great leader from about 5.30 until 11.30. There is really one real newspaper, and that Nodong Shimun, which is six pages long, and every article is about the great leader. 
So all the citizens have to wear the great leader pins at all times. Uh, and if you drop one, you know, I lived with these young men who are 20 year olds, and if, you know, one like accidentally fell off, then, I mean, it's like a crisis, because if you step on that, then, you know, that's a grave crime. So, basically, everyone is marked by these great leader images, and every room also has a portrait of the great leader, or the slogans, the sayings by the great leader. So the statistics about North Korea are really hard to verify. Um, there are about 10 to 20 gulag political camps, about 100 to 200,000 political prisoners. It's a country of 25 million people. Hunger level, we can verify it. Uh, it's between 60 to 70 percent. Malnutrition, sometimes it's for 80 percent. Sometimes it's uh, up down to 50, but basically, three quarters of the country suffers from malnutrition. Uh, and since Kim Jong-un uh, rose to power, of course, the first thing we saw was the brutality level because he then got his uncle executed basically in front of the world by dragging him out of a meeting. And that's Chang sung tae that was number two guy who was an uncle to, um, by marriage, but also pretty much raised Kim Jong-un. So to have him killed being one of the you know, important actions he's done kind of showed the world what the regime was capable of. And of course, the next thing we know is that Kim Jong-nam, to your left, is really the de facto uh, heir because he was the first son of the first wife of Kim Jong-il. Um, he was banished since 2003 he was sort of living uh, in Macau, and then uh, Kim Jong-un had him killed. Uh, if you remember, he was uh, assassinated at Kuala Lumpur airport using chemical agent. And we saw the world also saw uh, um, Otto Warmbier case, the American who went in and pulled down a poster, and then he came out pretty much a corpse. Um, so, you know, I think that all of these things that were showing the world what North Korea was capable of, but you know the reality in that nation had been horrifying for the last 70 years. So I wrote about that actually when Otto Warmbier's case happened, because tourism to North Korea really, you know, I called it torture porn, because when you think about it, it's the world's uh, the worst gulag at the moment with 25 million citizens in there. So tourism into North Korea isn't really, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a really an acceptable idea. Um, so the United Nations did claim, you know, the, one of the late statements was that the violations against humanity is actually unsurpassed in the contemporary, the level is unsurpassed. It is literally the world's worst place. Um, so, this is how I found Pyongyang when I went in in 2002. I went in for Kim Jong-il's 60th birthday celebration. So if you see that woman, she's holding, this is back in 2002, she's holding the sign that says the son of the 21st century because the great leader is the son. And his, his birthdays are referred to as the day of the son. Um, that was the original great leader's uh, statue that I had to bow to when I arrived my first time. I was taken to Kim Jong-il flower exhibition. Uh, the flowers are also named after the great leader. So um, you see a picture of a train that would be a train that later when Kim Jong-il dies in 2011, of course, the propaganda was that he worked so hard for his people that he had a heart attack, you know, overseeing the well-being of his citizens by riding those trains. Of course, we have no idea exactly how he died. He died in December 2011. So these vendors that they were taking you, I had to see uh, like hundreds of these vendors that show the great leader of flower. That's the Kim Il Sung Hwa, Kim Il Sung Ia, which is um, Kim Jong Il Lia, which is this red flower that reminds you of the Christmas plant. Because in a way that there's, you know, great leader is like the God figure. Um, that's the idea of Juche is the, um, 
the foundation concept of North Korea, Chuchemin self-reliance, which sounds grand, except that it really just refers to isolationism. When I went there in February uh, of 2002 for his birthday, all the citizens were dancing out on the street like that uh, for hours and hours and hours. Of course, I was told that they're voluntarily so happy to be celebrating the great leader's birthday, but North Korea is freezing. So it was minus, I don't know, I mean, it was, it was also there was just no heat. Because this also came, 2002 comes soon after uh, the end of 90s, which was the, the worst famine of North Korea, where um, about two to three million were reported to have died of hunger. So the country was just, there was absolutely nothing there. Um, so wherever you went in North Korea, there was just no heat and, and the citizens were celebrating. And also whoever follows North Korea will see these mass games that these children, you know, they will all, like you go to YouTube and you know, people are always posting these mass games, but it's really children who have been practicing for months and months and months to do like a little dance of like forming the petals of Kim Jong-il flowers. So to be taken to their rehearsals was actually, I found it really heartbreaking. Um, these were the like a workers party leaders that I had to, cause I, I went in my first time posing as a Kim Jong-il loyalist. So I had to uh, do karaoke with those guys which was really um, difficult because I didn't really know what kind of song to sing or what song is allowed in North Korea because the only songs that are allowed in there really are the great leader songs. Um, that's a sign which says we are happy um, as you are entering Pyongyang. So finally, after following North Korea for a decade, I was able to uh, court this organization to be given this title to teach at this university called Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. It was set up by fundamental evangelicals who had collaborated with the regime to set up this school. They fund everything. And um, that year, 2011, was actually not 2011. It was year 100. So in order to celebrate that, they shut down every university in the whole nation for a year, and they put all the young like college students into construction fields uh, for a year, saying that that's how they were celebrating. Of course, that year, Arab Spring was happening outside. So in North Korea, they were scattering, you know, instead of having them in colleges, they scatter the youth so they don't congregate. So being there, I knew that something terrible was about to happen. Um, so this particular university, all the young men who were there were handpicked. They were the only ones who were not in construction fields that year, so which goes to show you that these are the creme de la creme of North Korea. So that was my visa going in that time. Um, that's the university I was at. It was a, a military guarded uh, compound and that was it really. You know, everywhere you went, you were seen. That walkway that connected building to a building had windows on both sides. And I realized living there after a while because there were military guards guarding the building. We were never allowed out um, except with the minders the students were never allowed out. Nobody ever came in. And I realized even in the campus, wherever I went, I was seen. And that was the whole point. So I was teaching there English. And so you see the great leader portraits. And um, my classes were reported on and um, recorded. And every lesson plan had to be, be approved by the North Korean staff. And these were some of the young men doing group exercises. Their days were so carefully mapped out from the, th the time they wake up to until they go to bed from about 5.30 a.m. until 5 a.m. until like, you know, 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. And a lot of the day was occupied with the duties for the great leader, 
which would be like guarding the great leader building. There was one in the campus. There was a great leader celebrating monument in the campus. They had to clean that. So all these activities were to serve the great leader. So they were busy. So that you will see that building is the great leader study hall where they went every day to study the studies of the great leader. And that tower is the Tower of Immortality, which exists in other pockets of North Korea, including in Pyongyang. That Immortality Tower says on it, our great leader is eternally with us. And um, they called it the Forever Tower, and that's also decorated with the great leader flowers, and they had to clean that every day. So these were the young men that was take, that was a you know, picture of them uh, taking exams. I made sure their faces are never visible. Um, I remember that day because it was so cold that electricity, even here, which is funded by foreigners, electricity was cut nearly every day. And this was crime de la crime of North Korea. Also, there were computer majors, most of them, and they didn't know what the internet was. And I was not allowed to tell them the existence of the internet. So this is an election booth, which foreigners were taken to go and take a picture, very encouraged to take pictures, you know, decorated with you know, pretty women guarding, uh, like greeting you. And you go in there, and of course, they show you they have an election, which they do not. And that's a church they take you. North Korea has no freedom of religion, and proselytizing is an execution of a crime. But they do have at least two churches which foreigners are encouraged to come and take pictures just so that they can show you they have a freedom of religion, which, of course, they don't have. So this is how North Korea operates. A lot of it is about the propaganda of showing you the world that they carefully craft for you to then uh, spread the world as being their truth, which is actually not truth. It's a land which is completely built on lies. So, you know, that was a North Korean choir singing <laughs> hymns. And sitting there, I thought, because I went there with my group of evangelical Christians who had made a pact to the North Korean regime to come in there and fund, build this school. But one deal they made with the North Korean regime was they were going to pretend not to be Christians. So I was with them pretending to be Christians who were pretending not to be Christians. <laughs> And I remember being there in that church. So I was you know, pretending to be a Christian who are not pretending, and all the people I was with were fundamental evangelical Christians who were pretending not to be Christians. But in that church, which is kind of a fake church, North Koreans were now pretending to be Christians. So it was really a bizarre reality where everybody was pretending to be something else. You know? And I'm a writer who was pretending not to be a writer. That's a mountain I was taken to. It's really sad for a Korean. You know, I grew up hearing about these mountains. And this is Myohyangsan, Gumgangsan. These are two famous mountains I was taken to. All these people who had to flee North Korea, uh, they just spend their lifetime, mo you know, missing sight of North Korea. And when you went there, there were actually no people on it because North Koreans are not allowed to be on that mountain because North Koreans can't go anywhere. They need a travel pass to travel between towns. They cannot leave the country. And South Koreans cannot and go to those mountains. So in fact, these famous mountains were completely empty, except every, every surface was those inscriptions of the great leader. So the mountain also only belonged to the great leader. I remember being on that mountain, and I just wept because you know, this is a Korean tragedy. And I think all the heartbreak, like my grandmother, you know, she lost her son. Uh, he was 17 when he was taken to North. She never saw him again. She never moved because she thought he was gonna come home and he'll have to just ring the bell. And he never came home. And that's how those mothers who got separated from their sons or the sons themselves, this is how families got separated. And I think that heartbreak really came back to me when I was on that mountain um, that belonged to the great leader. So this is one of the final days in the campus where um, they had just finished taking their exam. I got to show, uh, I 
had, there was one movie that I was allowed to show them, um, which was actually Harry Potter. So they had just seen Harry Potter, and which was really also touching because I thought that they would really react to, I mean, there was a whole fiasco around Harry Potter, which I put in the book, because the evangelical, the North Korean stuff, I had to get it approved. North Koreans approved it, oddly enough. Um, all the students pretended they knew what it was, but they had no idea. They only saw mention in the textbook. And so they would ask me things like, how fun is it to play Quidditch? I mean, if you know Harry Potter, that's the game when you're on a broomstick on a sky. So they didn't know what it was. But I was actually able to get a DVD, and then I wanted to show it to them. My colleagues, the evangelical Christians, said they was evil, so they disapproved of Harry Potter which was really one of those amazing moments of censorship that was happening in that country. And uh, finally, when I showed it to them, I thought they would react to the special effect in that film, which was really miscalculation on my part, because actually we'd been, because you know, I was a teacher, that's, that was my role, so I had been doing drilling things, two things in particular, these were my journalistic method. I insisted they have to write me weekly letters to learn English properly, but that was for me to understand what they were thinking. And that was approved, so I was getting these weekly letters from them detailing their lives. Another thing I was also you know, really, really insisting them was the idea of an essay, because I needed to know also how they were forming their thoughts. And it was nearly impossible to teach them essays because essays are about critical thinking. Essays involve introduction, thesis sentence, proofs, conclusion. All these things are actually about critical thinking process. It was impossible for them to understand it for these really smart kids. And finally, essay became the one thing they hate the most. And when we were watching Harry Potter, Hermione, actually in the movie, says, oh, I have to write an essay for Professor Snape's class. And all my students just went, oh! and then afterward they said, Professor Hermione doesn't like essays either. <laughs> and I, my heart broke, I remember when they said that, because that's what they, you know, that's what stuck with them, this connection with this girl in this movie in the outside world which they're never allowed. And that was the most memorable thing for them about Harry Potter. It was not the special effect. Yeah, that, so that was them watching Harry Potter next to the great leader sayings on the wall. Um, the reason the screen's so small is because you cannot move those great leader things. You know, so there is actually no blank wall. I looked all over the camp, like a school buildings, to see if there's a blank wall so I can project it bigger. There wasn't any, and 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 this is how North Korea is. So on my last day, the great leader died. So I did get to see the reaction that was not meant for like a CNN camera that the rest of the world got to see with all these weeping North Koreans. What I actually saw in my students was far worse. They were so heartbroken and the sorrow in them was so genuine that I cried looking at them crying. Um, so it was a devastating day. I see the, um, and I just will conclude this part with the video of the young man that I've been talking about, who I really, really loved. Um, so you get to see a little bit of what they were like. So 
this was them just marching to the cafeteria three times a day like that, just for a meal. And each time they had to sing the great leader songs. You've, uh, you've taken... I'm saying you, you've taken all my questions away now. Um, you, you've explained it so well. Um, let me ask you a couple of things, and then we'll invite the audience. Um, one thing you mentioned about going to uh, the election booth. Um, you know, they take taking foreigners. The thing about North Korea that I found very strange is this combination of, uh, as a, as a foreign visitor, uh, your the restrictions on you, places you can't go. Um, in fact, you need permission to go anywhere. Combination of that and the odd places they take you. When I was, the first time I went um, as a tourist, uh, I was taken to a maternity hospital. And we were actually, doctors took us into the wards where there were women who just had babies. It's like, um, you know, and the reason was they were very proud of this. So I wonder if you could say something about uh, sorry, this is a long-winded qu question. What did you see of North Korea? I don't know if you talk about the fact you weren't allowed to see much. Um, the thing is with North Korea, you know, you will see what they decide that you should see. So, like the first time I was taken to uh, all these official meetings because my role then was the Kim Jong-il loyalist. Uh, my time, when I went in with the Philharmonic, we were being shown, of course, all the fancy sites because 100 journalists were in there. Um, my final time there, I was in the campus the entire time. Uh, when they were showing me things, it was just a random you know, sites like Apple Farm that went on for hours and hours and hours. What was... Uh, Remarkable about those trips, of course, is the fact that it doesn't matter what it is. It's all about the great leader, because you get basically explanation that just goes on. I mean, it's really quite boring to be told about the same guy over and over and over again. The occasional, what you so what you, as a journalist, what you're looking for is those occasional slips that might happen, which happened once that felt unscripted, which was actually during the Apple Farm visit, where a local old lady peeked out, because because one of the teachers suddenly needed to use a toilet, and there weren't any, because it was quite new then. So they had to take us to a, f like a f where people lived. And this old lady uh, peeked out, although it was her house, it was her, her toilet. And we were using it, and um, the minder that we were with told her to uh, go away and stop talking. And she was so terrified. Uh, and she was like like 90 years old. And she was so terrified by this minder that she immediately shut down her window and, and stopped. So it's things like that, I think, no matter how much it's carefully crafted, um, these peaks of, I guess, fear you see. And another thing that is alarming, of course, is why it is so crafted that those unscripted moments are so rare. Even with my students, I think by the time I went in, you know, I knew I felt as much there was to know. Uh, so I knew I wasn't going to get anything that was not scripted. What I was more after was how my students thought. Because that you can't really get. And they also, the way they were guarded was alarming. But let, their let minds me... kept slipping, you know, things kept slipping. Let me ask you about the students. Um, if North Korea is this um, horrible dictatorship that you've described, and I think it is, um, you would sort of think that um, going there to teach the sons of the elite is a bit like going to Berlin to teach the sons of the Nazi leaders or something. But in the book, you, you actually develop a lot of affection for these young people. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that contradiction a little bit. Um, you know, I think that is the embedded journalism. When I went in, I didn't know who I was going to meet. Uh, one of the questions you do, I mean, one of the things I do when I am embedded in different situations is actually never ask a lot of questions because then they will m maybe not take you in. You know, I courted this organization for about three years. So, but I had no idea who my students were going to be. 
so I didn't go in with that preconceived notion. I did question what are fundamental evangelical Christians doing funding the education of North Korea's future leadership? That's a valid question. But individually interacting with the students, I just did what I m could do one-on-one, -on -one, which was getting to know them as much as possible. Like who they are, but as, as I got to know them, I think what was really, really broke heartbreaking was that how little they knew, how little control they had over their lives, how they had no agency, and how they were also afraid. Yeah, actually, one of the uh, ways that, or the two ways that North Korea has built probably the most successful repressive state in history, in my opinion, um, one is the, the nature of the, the brutality, the, the viciousness, um, but the other is the control of information. Uh, the famous example the New York Times wrote a generation ago was that the North Koreans, the ordinary North Koreans, still don't know that man landed on the moon because the men on the moon were Americans and this was considered um, information they didn't need to know. Um, so uh, the other one I, I was reminded of when you talked about the church was, uh, I think it was the Washington Post reporter being a clever guy um, was brought to this church and after the service he asked three of the old ladies there, um, oh, can you name me three books in the Bible? And they couldn't. So apparently these people, they were the sons and daughters of Christians who were in good standing with the party pretending to be Christians. You know? And I think there are things that when you live, I mean, that's I think maybe was my biggest lesson also being there is that I had been there and I had talked to so many North Korean defectors. I thought I knew uh, as much as I was going to see. First of all, that final time after a decade, the control there was far worse than my worst nightmare. I realized they really didn't know uh, the, the, the Lack of their knowledge was astounding, but they all pretend to know in the beginning, but as they trust me more and more, sometimes when they feel like, first of all, it's a system of surveillance, right? Like they have a meeting every Saturday where they have to report on each other. So they cannot just ask me a question, but when they can sort of sneak a question, it'll be things like, and they've been so adamant they knew what the internet was, and then at one point, Months into it, they would ask me, like, so teacher, can you see, like, five movies on the internet or can you see ten movies on the internet? Like, they had no idea internet was infinity. And these young men were from, like, it, when they, so when they shut down all university, these 270 were handpicked by Kim Chek University and Kim Il-sung University. These are Harvard and MIT. They are... North Korea's top, top universities. So for them to have no clue like that, I mean, it was, it was, and I think the media doesn't want to believe that it's as bad as it is, which is so astounding to me. Yeah, that's a, a neat uh, segue, the internet story is a segue into another question, which is, um, about, and I'd like to ask you about language as a way of illustrating this, but uh, the point being, or the question being, um, the two Koreas, the Koreans were the same people um, for, they got a mythical history that goes back 5,000 years. Um, their state existed rough, roughly around the same borders as today for about 1,300 years. So they were divided, so the same people, but went off in totally different directions. Here's South Korea, so the, one of the most wired countries in the world. Here's North Koreans, don't know what the internet is. Um, I remember an old uh, linguistics professor of mine said, if you separate two peoples into two tribes and there's no contact between them, and by the way, there's absolutely no contact allowed of any sort between unsanctioned, between North and South Koreans. Uh, I think he said within two or three generations, the, langu the language will start to go off and within a couple more, they actually won't be able to understand each other. And you mentioned in your book that you were surprised at the quaint and archaic use of language and also by the vulgarities that were like the word bastard, the Korean word for bastard, people were just referred to as bastards. Um, you were a bit surprised by that. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how these Koreans, not, they're not the same, but how they're different. Well, 
Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, those are the, you know, there's so many points that are uh, kind of subtle. Uh, and one of that was the more and more linguistically, first of all, it's the same. You know, it's just accents are different. But of course, with no contact, words will remain that, you know, completely unchanged for 70 years. But another thing that was always alarming with North Korea is that they curse all the time. It's so violent. <laughs> and the violent level and the cursing level, it's as if it was resembling the regime. You know, and their language was beginning to resemble the regime. And I think that that's really a horrifying thought. So if you have a really bloody regime, then it's going to reflect on the language. And even also, it's all war related, because North Korea, the entire way it operates is that they put fear in people that the war is imminent. So what that means is my students called the classroom platoon, and class monitor was a, a you know, platoon leader, and every workplace they refer to as battlefield. So these are just small examples, but language can actually psychologically affect you, and that's how North Korea is that on every level. Uh, the workplace is a battlefield. It's like Samsung, isn't it? Or, uh, no, anyway. um, uh, you mentioned also in the book that one of your uh, Christian colleagues, one of your fellow teachers, tried to teach the, child, the students about love in the English writing class and said, you know, would you write stories? You tried to get them to write stories about love. But um, you wrote it. It's really interesting. You said... Um, uh, they wrote these stories about love, but they always managed to kill off um, the protagonists every time. And your colleague felt that uh, they were obsessed with death. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think their world does revolve around that. I think that every story they are told are about the fact they are actually weapons for the great leaders you know, the, the well-being being of their motherland. So if they're all about war and weapons, that happens just all the time in their lives. So I think that that reflects, for example, like we had to do one of the uh, silly summer activity was making origami just to teach English words. And they didn't know how to make anything except a warship. So all of them literally didn't know anything else except a weapon was the only thing they knew how to make out of a paper. So, I mean, psychologically, there were so many of these things that were so one-track minded. You know, North Korean young men have to serve army mandatory 10 years unless you're elite. So imagine that. And during those 10 years, you're not really allowed to go home except a few times. So, and I knew that because they would talk about you know, cases of how long, you know, someone they knew went to an army and just they didn't see them. So it was not like I was interviewing to try to get this information. It came out through living with them. And I realized, so from ages of 17 to 27, you serve a ar mandatory army service. What that means is that you're separated from your family. And you also don't, you know, form relationships with other people. And you're only trained to be a soldier. So if they do that to all the young men, I mean, it's, it's, it's so systematically done how to take away the humanity. Okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, when the book came out, uh, there was uh, some criticism that I'd like to ask you to respond to. Um, you know, when you go undercover, let's say you're a spy. When you go undercover as a spy, you go back and report to your bosses and the people that you've been dealing with, none of, probably none of them will, will, nobody will know because it's confidential. The problem with being a journalist is you're going undercover to publicize something. Um, so the, cr the criticism was that you, um, you put the school at risk um, because they, uh, North Korea tends to close down joint ventures and things very rapidly, so the school was at risk. Um, but you may have also put your students at risk. Uh, could you respond to that? So, uh, you know, it's, it was un unbelievable, the, actually, the amount of backlash that happened when the book came out. And when you look at the uh, ethics of professional journalists, the official ethics, it actually tells you that if you cannot 
cover it in any traditional way. In this case of North Korea, traditional reporting, I think, actually has served as a PR for North Korean regime. You know, when CNN goes in there for a couple of days and randomly interviews people, those are not random. It's been handpicked for you by the North Korean regime. So if traditional reporting is not working, then there is no other method. That's when you use undercover reporting. Also, another thing is if it's actually for a grave, worldly important topic, which in case this is, it's the world's most violent nation, and we don't know anything about what's going on inside. So there was really no other way for me to go except to go undercover. It took me years to even court the organization. I had a book contract long before I went into North Korea. When I was in there, I you know, wrote all my, uh, my notes on my laptop, which I raised off the computer every single time I signed off, and I had a USB stick on my body that I wore around like a necklace, and I had it um, at all times. I created an SD card backup, which I hid in the room with the light off, because I knew what the consequences are. You know, it's never been done in this way, and people have gone in for like a couple of days, but no one had lived there among North Koreans like that. So I knew the consequences would be that I would be sent to a gulag in the, probably the best scenario. So I think that to be attacked for that reporting, and I, and I did an essay about it for the New Republic, because my book was packaged as a memoir, which, you know, they don't do that. You know, when a man goes in, <laughs> and they've never, when a woman goes in, somehow it became a memoir about her finding herself in Pyongyang or something like that. Whereas when men go in, it's investigative journalism. So I think that the attack had a lot to do with it. Since then, first of all, the school was collaborating with the North Korean regime. Nothing happened to the school. The school had expanded since the book, actually, in double the size because they pour, funnel a lot of money into North Korea. Student-wise, in the book, if you read the book, they are very loyal to the regime. Anything that would be problematic have already been deleted. And not only that, um, I had to make sure that you cannot identify any of them. That's the students all kind of become like a group. I couldn't make them like an like a individual in a way. So you do take all this consideration when you are um, doing a, a project like this, because I didn't stumble upon this. I think I was really shocked by how many journalists came out of woodwork to attack this because I was in their territory. And why New York Times did a story on my line. So when I looked into that, actually, you know, white men who have gone into other places undercover are hailed. I just did a panel with two of them um, who went undercover as prison guards. And they've both been hailed for their brave journalism. So it's not usual for undercover journalists to get attacked this way. But in my case, I was. And I think a lot has to do with the fact that, you know, it was if people wanted to go in there somehow and no one has. OK. Um, thank you. Uh, I do apologize. We've talked too long. But we have almost 15 minutes. So. Um, there are microphones um, uh, there. Okay, the gentleman with the beret. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you for getting up in the beginning. In English, you say to stand up for something, right? And you stood up for Korea. Thank you. Number two, you mentioned courage. The Latin root, courage, means heart. You have a very great heart. Thank you very much. And our question, I've read that women in your history for 500 years, they could not meet men during the day. Only in the evening after sunset, when the man had left the roads, they could meet men and they got very nervous and sick. But a few elite bribed and they could go to the temple. Do you know what they did in the temple? Um, sorry, you've lost me in the temple bit. Uh, let me speak on... Uh, Suki just gave me a wink as to say, you take this. So let me speak on behalf of Korean women. Um, it, it's true. I think to some extent it's true. There was a Confucian dynasty which ran the country for 600 years until the beginning of the last century. And at heightened moments of that in the capital in Seoul, 
Uh, men and women, by the way, were very, very separated. Even when the early Christians came in the 19th, late 19th century, the churches, men and women sat on different sides. Uh, but yeah, you're correct. You're correct that uh, women were allowed out after dark, and then men had to be sort of out of the way. True. Okay, um, gentleman with the yellow shirt. Then um, can we? We don't have a lot of time, so I appreciate the interest. But the gentleman with the yellow shirt here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, next. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, I wa my question is. Uh, as you said, uh, all the North Korean citizens are quite, uh, they are watched all the time, right? But one place maybe they are not watched is they are uh, in their homes. So uh, do you have any experience to share? I'm, I'm wondering what they must discuss on the dining table, like in a family. You know, I mean, the whole, I mean, it's not like I could actually, if, if I'm ever in someone's home, it would be uh, carefully manipulated. So that's not a knowledge that you can get by, you know, silently observing someone's home. What I understood from my students, and I mean, this is true actually when you interview defectors. One thing about living in a gulag like that is everyone is so busy. So we ask these random questions. For example, when I went in, when New York Philharmonic went to give a concert, I would ask things. I think back then I didn't quite understand the level. I would ask, like, what do you think about the fact? You know, like right now, people are all asking, so what do you think about how North Koreans react to the Olympics happening? Or, you know, these questions are meaningless if you're busy all day from getting up at 5.30 a.m. until you go to bed and you have to do either labor or you have to go to meetings for the great leader and you just have so little time. So, of course, there's love. My students miss their mother so much and their sisters and their brothers. However, at the same time, they don't, it's like two different things. You know, they're just so busy serving their great leader. So it leaves a very little time for that. Um, um, I wanted sorry. to thank you, first of all. It was just a very brilliant and moving presentation. And it was clear that you were very moved by your experience there, so thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask the, um, when you expose an unexposed audience to a kind of an emotional medium such as cinema, uh, which you've never really seen, I think back to my children who hadn't seen television when they were very little, and the first time my daughter saw Disney, she just couldn't take the emotional uh, sort of message that was coming through because she hadn't been tuned to it. Uh, I just wondered what their experience, emotional experience of the whole Harry Potter thing was. You know, the thing is, so people ask me that kind like similar stuff. How do they react to certain things? So some North Koreans through the border with China, no more. Um, elites might get some information, but I think we judge them the way we live in a free world. So let's say, it's not like none of them have ever seen movies, right? Like sometimes there are these illegal DVDs. I knew one student had definitely seen an NBA game. North Koreans don't watch games where they are not playing or where they do not win. So for him to have seen an uh, American basketball, he must have seen it on a DVD that was not allowed. However, um, it's not like you can make all those pieces fit, you know? For you to know what Harry Potter is or what, what that means is, is you need other information for the puzzle to all fit. Just because you see a Western movie once, you know, they actually officially were not allowed any film except March of Penguin and Lion King. I mean, these are 20-year-olds. But I think that that critical thinking one needs for the world to make sense isn't, it's just everything is so controlled. So imagine you have a system where you cannot go anywhere physically without a permission. You've never had a real education because the education system, you need the rest of the world for it to make sense. How can you teach history, biology, literature, and pretend, or computer, and pretend the world does not exist, that means there is no education except for the great leader. So that knocks out your ability to think that way. Also, there's a worship of the great leader, which is an ideology called to worship. So, and there's no communication that is allowed without someone watching you all the time. So there's a system of fear. So the thing you're saying, like their emotional reaction, yes, there is, but for your emotional reaction to now be nurtured and go forward, you need these other things to continue. Um, if I could just 
clarify, I didn't mean uh, how, yes, what was their emotional reaction. I just meant that the, emo the impact of seeing something for which you're not emotionally prepared or trained or don't have somehow the, maybe even the cognitive uh, processing, uh, I just wondered what the response They didn't really show much emotion. Yes. And I think some of that is because they're not allowed to ever really show emotion because their emotions could get them killed. But I think when they did gasp over Hermione's use of the word essay, it's those little moments of slip you're looking for as a journalist, when actually their feels and feelings come out. But living in fear, and we, you know, North Korea always compare it to the worst abused household. If you imagine living in a controlled household where you're being beaten and raped all the time, and you can't talk to anybody, that's kind of how I imagine the country. And in that world, there's a fear guiding you all the time. So even if they're curious, it's like two different thoughts exist, you know? You might know, you might not know. You might believe in the great leader, you might not believe in the great leader. And I think this confusion all the time makes you be curious and then not be curious because you're so afraid what could happen. Okay, um, we'll come to you at the back in a minute. There's a gentleman down the front. Sorry? Out of time? Oh, is that the... Okay, the gentleman down the front has been dying to ask a question, and... Very, very quickly. Thank you. Um, your brave undercover journalism adds to our knowledge of this paranoid society, but one of the things it seems to me people rarely ask is, where did it all come from in the first place? Do you ever have, do you have a sense of, of how this extraordinary society was created? I mean, it's a complication. That's really a complicated thought that I struggled with there all the time, actually throughout my research of a decade. I think, of course, it began with the colonial uh, remapping when they cut up a nation that's 5,000 year old, overnight created a line. US really did that, um, and Russia. And when you do cut up family like that, and then just put a wall between them. They can never meet again. I don't know what happens to that heartbreak. So yes, the origin has happened because of, of course Korea it, it itself is also responsible for allowing this to continue and continue and continue. And basically these thugs came in, you know, South also had a dictator. And North Korea also, then Kim, Kim Il-sung came. So these dictators are funded by the superpowers. Had, you know, started this, this, this system just got worsened and worsened and worsened. However, I think that what's more frightening is what happens to all this history that got wiped out, people who died there for three generations, who were trapped there, died of a heartbreak. And I think that this is an alarming question and we don't see the end in sight. Nothing in North Korea is changing. It doesn't matter they're marching in the Olympic, making it look like South Korea and North Korea are talking. The reality in there is the darkest way for any human being to be allowed to live that way. And I think it's a question that we really have to ask. Like what will happen to this world? Also, it's so psychologically damaged. Tragedy shouldn't be continuing this way for three generations. I mean, Nazi concentration camp was a couple, you know, few years. We've never seen anything like North Korea that's continued for 70 years in that darkness and isolation. You just saw that NASA map. I mean, that's, that's a few years ago. <laughs> they live that way now. Okay, thank you very much. I'd just like... Uh,